Hello and welcome to a walk in the garden. I'm Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance. Welcome to gardeners across the United States and to our international guests as well. As we all adapt to the challenges and restrictions of this COVID-19 virus, we hope that these weekly virtual walks in the garden will add a bit of beauty to your day and inspire you to visit, create, and enjoy gardens in your area when you're able. Today, I'd like to introduce Dan Jaffe Wilder, who will share his wit and wisdom as he presents Adventures with Oddities, Strange and Noteworthy Native Plants. Dan Jaffe Wilder is a photographer, author, and plant propagator. He's currently the propagator and staff photographer at Norcross Wildlife Sanctuary in Wales, Massachusetts. As you'll learn today, Dan is passionate about ecological horticulture and native plants with ornamental and wildlife value in addition to those quirky, strange characteristics. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Penny. Um, thanks for having me. It's it's nice to talk to everyone today. I, I wish I could see you in person, but I'm glad we've got, you know, what we've got these days. Um, so this should be a, a good deal of fun. Um, for those of you who've heard me lecture before, this is a little bit different from my normal style. Um, normally, I'm kind of really uh, uh, pushing the, the kind of educational component, um, you know, as heavily as possible. Today is, is hopefully going to be very educational, but it's also really just meant to be fun. Um, there are some odd plants in the native flora, and I thought it was worth bringing them up. And when Penny approached me, uh, you know, during the current times, it seemed real fitting to, to come up with something a little more playful than the usual way. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to kind of just get us moving here. Um, come on. There we go. Okay. So what we're looking at today are what I'm going to call nine strange themes, and I expect this is going to be somewhat cryptic. Um, hopefully it'll start to make sense as we go through it. Um, first off is, is what I like to call unexpected value, um, plants that are doing something for us that we might not have realized that they were at first doing. Um, we're going to jump into cool history. There is some very, very interesting history associated with some of the, the species in our native flora, milkweed being one of many. Um, there are some also very interesting survival strategies. Um, one of the, the kind of amazing things about our native flora is we have this amazing diversity of kind of plants that are, are adapted to different conditions in different regions. And with that adaptability comes all these unique survival strategies. Something that is near and dear to my heart, um, we're going to jump into strange and wonderful flavors. I have a number of lectures that are, are dedicated entirely to this. <clears throat> Um, and there are some, some very, very tasty things out there that I think everyone really ought to get to know. Um, we can't do strange and wonderful natives without powerful poison. There are some very interesting poisons in our native flora. What's kind of amazing to me that I, that I always find intriguing is that um, many of our edible plants are also some of our most poisonous plants, and it's often just about what part of the plant you're talking about. Um, you know, for example, you would not want to be eating tomato leaves. Um, the same way you would, you know, you wouldn't want to be eating the, the roots of, of that tomato. You wouldn't want to be eating the berries of the potato. You get the idea. It's really about the right part of the plant. We're going to jump to strange places. Um, this will probably make no sense to anybody at the moment, but I promise it'll make sense when we get to it. So I'm just going to kind of breeze on past that. Um, we'll get into odd sex. Um, the orchids specifically are very kind of devious in the way that they reproduce. There are some amazing attractions within our native flora. This is, in many cases, what really got me into native plants is, is the fact that it's not just about the plant itself, but about what it does in the ecosystem, um, what else is attracted to it and feeds upon it and feeds off of it and so forth. And there's some amazing connections out there. Um, finally, we'll get into the necessary uses, um, odd uses of native plants that aren't necessarily what you might first think. Um, this is probably all seeming somewhat cryptic, and I'm expecting that a lot of it will start to make sense as we jump into it. Um, so let's kind of just get running here. Um, this is Aronia. This one specifically is Aronia arbutifolia, the red chokeberry. Um, we've also got, where are you? There's some more arbutifolias. Here it is. This is Aronia melanocarpa, the black chokeberry. Um, if you haven't already noticed, they are named for the colors of their berries. 
these are fantastic shrubs that I think really are, are underutilized within our um, kind of horticultural industry. They are um, they're, they're plants that will happily grow in standing wet conditions. I often see them growing in bogs or drainage ditches. Um, that being said, they're also perfectly fine growing in dry soils. Um, once they're established, they're able to do just about anything. They bloom in the spring, they produce these great berries in the summertime, and then they give you this wonderful fall foliage, um, you know, the bright red colors that you're seeing here. Um, it's something that I, I think really more people ought to be using. Uh, what's so unexpected about them, though, is we hear a lot these days about the value of antioxidants in our diet. Um, I often hear lowbush blueberry touted as kind of the antioxidant king. Um, black chokeberry specifically has seven times more antioxidants in the berries than that of lowbush blueberry. Um, it blows lowbush blueberry out of the water, which um, is a little odd, considering lowbush blueberry is indeed a fantastic source of antioxidants. Uh, most people don't think about eating the chokeberries, uh, mainly because they are named chokeberry. It's a, an unfortunate name for a plant that is actually perfectly edible. Um, the reason it's called chokeberry is that the berries are, are not just sweet, but they also have a distinct bitterness to them. Um, I've heard some people claim it's the high levels of antioxidants that cause them to taste so bitter. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, you know, it's a good story nonetheless. Um, most people who eat these usually end up juicing them, um, mixing them with other things. In fact, if you look at some of the ocean spray juice mixes, you'll see a lot of chokeberry kind of listed in their ingredients, but they, they're better marketers than whoever came up with the name chokeberry, and they like to call this aronia berry. So aronia berry is a superfood, and chokeberry is just chokeberry. Um, these are wonderful plants, though. Whether it be aesthetic or edible, this is a plant that everyone ought to get to know. So... The next on our list, pines. Um, the pine trees are, are overlooked, um, and I think part of the reason is they're just they're just so darn common. Um, you know, you 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 couldn't really go 20 feet in New England without hitting a pine tree. Um, likely an eastern white pine if you're in the coastal region, maybe a pitch pine. Um, these are by no means rare plants, um, though there are some less common species. Um, this guy here, this is pitch pine. Um, I'm a big fan of this one. If you live in the coastal regions, you probably get to know this pretty well. Um, you can find it inland as well, um, though it's it's much more common in coastal regions where you see these kind of sandy, um, dry habitats that are often associated with the coastal sand plains. Um, where you find this inland is often coastal, uh, sorry, not coastal, um, glacial sort of outwashes, um, high dry ridge tops, um, glacial moraines, areas with good drainage. Um, that being said, you will also sometimes find this as a bog species. It's kind of odd that it can kind of show up in either direction. The unexpected value on these guys is, again, an edible value. Um, these guys have, I think if I remember my numbers right, it's eight times more vitamin C within the pine needles than you'll find in an orange rind. Um, this is a vitamin C kind of pack house. And the funny part is you'll actually find even more vitamin C within the bark of the plant than you do in the needles. Um, that being said, I usually tend to find myself making tea out of the needles. It's surprising how tasty this is. Um, and if you haven't tried it before and you haven't really delved into kind of wild edibles, this is a, a fine place to start because it's, you know, who can't find themselves a pine tree? Um, grab some of the, the young needles. You don't want to grab the old stuff now. Wait till they've sprouted and you've got some fresh stuff. Throw them into some hot water. Let it steep for a couple of minutes, and you'll find it has a nice, light, piney sort of flavor and is really full of vitamin C. Um, if, if this was something that, you know, the kind of sailors knew of the earlier era, scurvy would have been much less of a problem because it's quite easy to store this stuff. And the vitamin C, though it does decline in storage, is there enough where you could easily use it in the long term. Um, getting off eating things for a bit, this is cinnamon fern. Um, so a lot of people don't tend to think of ferns, and I'll throw the grasses and the graminoids into this um, mix for the moment, as um, really important, say, pollinator plants or, or wildlife value plants. We tend to think, you know, when, when someone hears the word pollinator plant, you think of something like uh, milkweed and the monarch butterfly. Or maybe you think about that chokeberry, and you think about the birds coming down and eating the berries. Um, what we often miss are the leaves as an important source of kind of habitat for wildlife. Um, think about a lot of the, the native caterpillars that eat the, the native leaves. Um, this is why something like an oak tree is on the top of um, Doug Talamay's list. Cinnamon fern takes it even to another direction. It's not even the leaves that we're looking at. Um, it's the hairs themselves. Um, if you see on the left here, you see those um, the, the young stems with those kind of young hairs coming out on them. Um, hummingbirds will often collect those and other birds as well and use them to line their nests. Um, it's wonderful cushioning for their delicate eggs, for the chicks. 
Um, this is one of those kind of indirect connections that we've started to realize are, are all throughout the flora. Um, it's, it's quite amazing how many different interactions exist beyond even just the, the regular ones, you know, beyond the, the flowers and the berries and even beyond the leaves and into things like hairs and bark and root pieces. This is a wonderful species, um, one that I really think people should be using more often. It's named cinnamon fern for um, this, this fertile structure that you can see on the right here, um, you know, the color of cinnamon, hence cinnamon fern. The species that you'll often find planted or, or you know, growing in wet conditions. It does very well in those areas. It'll grow in, in kind of average garden soils, but it doesn't want to be in any sort of a dry spot. I've always admired the ferns in the early season. Um, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this structure as they emerge, these kind of fiddleheads that you'll find on this and a variety of other species have this wonderful architecture that I've, I've always really dug and makes me really enjoy them in the kind of early spring gardens. And then later on in the season, you get this lush foliage that just pairs well with broader leaves and various other things. Well, uh, I'll throw at least one, maybe two more ferns into this lecture that we'll get to as we keep going. So historically, there's, there's a lot of historical use in our native flora. When you start getting into the history kind of before, you know, the European settlement and get into, you know, Native American and First Peoples history, you find masses of history of kind of plant use. Um, but it didn't end when, you know, the, the European settlement happened. You'll still find history kind of kicking in into that, you know, less historical phase. Milkweed is a very good example of this. Um, this one here, this is the Thlepia syriaca. This is the common milkweed. This is the one that you'll find growing in fields often. You know, you never find just one. When you find a field chock full of masses of milkweeds, we're talking about thousands, you're very likely looking at common milkweed. Um, and if you kind of start looking towards comparing it with other species, you don't tend to think of this. This is the Indonesian kapok tree. And this is where the history comes in. So during uh, World War II, um, the U.S. was in need of fiber. Um, we used fiber for a variety of different reasons. One of the more important ones was stuffing life preservers for the Air Force and the Navy, and this kapok tree was our source. Um, on the right here, you could see this. Uh, they called it floss. It was the fiber that um, is produced on the kapok tree. You could see something similar on our milkweed on the left here. Um, what it is is it's a, a structure, you know, kind of formed by the plant to help in seed dispersal. You know, the wind catches this stuff, it blows it long distances, it can float on the water, it can kind of blow across the surface of soil. Good way of, of moving seed around. Yes, so um, this kapok tree was right used now. to stuff, um, you know, our, our life preservers. And during World War II, the Japanese um, invaded Indonesia, seized these kapok fields, and the U.S. was struggling to quickly find a new source of material. Um, and milkweed was it. We, we found that Asclepia syriaca worked wonderfully as a flotation device, um, very light, and it was used, um, it was collected um, in masses by the public. This was something that a lot of schools got connected with, and they would collect large amounts of this, and it was sent off for the war effort. In terms of growing these species, there's a variety of different plants that I recommend growing. Um, the first one we were talking about, let's go back to a quick second, common milkweed. Um, this is the one that I often recommend when people have tough areas. Um, this is a vigorous spreading species. It's not a good plant for small spaces unless you have, you know, weeds or invasives that you want to push back against. Um, that being said, it's fantastic for areas where you want that sort of vigor. What I really think we should be doing more with things like common milkweed is planting this on roadsides. I would love to see every highway and, and road in New England kind of, you know, covered in common milkweed and, and various other kind of strong spreading species. In terms of garden settings, um, I often find myself leaning in the direction of one of these two species. Rose milkweed, um, Asclepius incarnata. This is the one that's often, often sometimes called um, the, the swamp milkweed. You'll find this one often growing in wet areas um, alongside other species like the Joe pie weeds um, or, or desmodiums or cattails. This is a species that can handle these standing wet conditions, but is also perfectly fine growing in average garden soils, um, which means that it's quite adaptable. It's got a flower that at first glance is quite similar to the common milkweed, but unlike common milkweed, this is a clumping species. It tends to kind of sit in place. You know, each plant gets a bit bigger, but it's not going to run throughout the garden. On the other end of the moisture spectrum, you get this, the species on your left here, Sclepis tuberosa. And if we go into those average garden settings, both of these will grow just fine. 
Um, and where rose milkweed can handle the standing wet, um, the butterfly milkweed can handle the other end of the spectrum into those very, very dry sites. Um, so when we're talking about, say, pitch pines in the coastal sand plain region growing in what amounts to pretty much pure sand, you'll find species like butterfly milkweed growing underneath it. Um, these other species you see here, this is Baptisia tinctoria, um, yellow wild indigo in, in front, and then in back is Rebecca herda, the, one of the black-eyed Susans. All great choices for kind of sunny, dry conditions. Um, both of these, I'd say, make better kind of typical garden plants than the common milkweed because they're both good clumping species. Um, common milkweed, on the other hand, is your solution plant. When you've got tough spaces, nothing is growing well, you need something that can handle the sort of abuse that, that a lot of species can't handle, that's where you go with common milkweed. Another species that I think is worth at least mentioning, this is purple milkweed, um, Asclepius purpuracens. Um, this is a rare species in New England. You don't find it around very much. Um, there's a little bit of it in the trade, and there's some folks growing it. Um, it'll grow in conditions that are, are similar to the guy on the left here, Asclepius tuberosa. It tends to like sunny, dry conditions. Um, if you happen to know a site where this one's growing, it's one to marvel at, but, you know, please don't go digging at it. As I said, this is a rare species, um, but a beautiful one nonetheless, and one that I, I wish more people could get to know. Okay, um, moving along in our historical kind of uh, view of, of the native flora, this is sweet birch. Um, and sweet birch is a name that kind of matches a couple different species. You'll see up on the top here, I've listed both Betula alleghaniensis and Betula lenta. Um, if you want to get into kind of, I think, more consistent common names, that would be yellow birch and black birch, or sometimes called cherry birch. Um, both of them fit under the name sweet birch because of their flavor. Um, and if you're ever unsure of, of the identification on one of these trees, this is where I recommend the scratch and sniff test. Um, these, these sweet birches, especially when they're young before the bark becomes more evident, can easily be mistaken for our native cherries, um, even for the invasive buckthorn. And if you're not sure what you're looking at, just go up to one of the branches, um, scratch it with your thumb a little bit, and put your nose to it. And if it smells kind of like a sweet wintergreen, like birch beer, like root beer, you're looking at one of the sweet birches. If it smells more astringent, you're probably looking at a cherry. And if it doesn't smell like anything but wood, you're probably looking at buckthorn. So on the left here is yellow birch. On the right here is black birch. Um, you'll notice how yellow birch gives you a little bit of a peel. It's not quite as peely as our typical white kind of paper birches that can be really, really peely. Um, compare that, though, to the, the species on the right here, black birch. Um, this one really doesn't peel like a typical birch does. Um, it is a birch tree. It's, it's closely related. It's just got a different sort of structure. Um, in time, it gets more platy, but it can easily be mistaken for a native cherry if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Um, the bark is, is different as it matures, but in the young stages, they can be really you know, challenging, and that's where that sniff really helps. Beautiful fall color on both of these species. Um, white birch and, uh, and, and um, gray birch and uh, river birch kind of in between um, can, can sometimes give you some really nice fall color and sometimes just kind of yellowing. Um, the sweet birches turn these wonderful kind of brilliant shades of yellow. The bark can really be quite nice as well, um, and it's, it can be really a beautiful tree. Here's the historical part of it. Um, the birch trees were originally used to make birch beer. Um, birch beer was, was drank in quite um, regularly back in the day, and the reason for that was that in many cases it was safer than typical water. Um, before our understanding of microbiology kind of existed, we, we understood that that stagnant old water could get us sick, but we didn't quite understand why. Um, and there was a point before that, that why was explored where people realized that certain things were safer to drink. Um, it's not that our ancestors were all running around drunk all the time. In most cases, these, these alcohols were actually quite low, more in the kind of 1% to 3% alcohol range. Um, you know, compare that to a, a light beer in the 5% range or a heavy beer in the kind of 7 8% range. You can see it's, it's quite a bit lower. The great difference here was that this birch beer or typical ales or any other beers at the time were sterilized. Um, first, they were boiled in order to make the beer itself. And then the alcohol that settled in there, that, that ethanol, is actually a good sterilizer. Um, so birch beer was made back in the day. And I found this um, a little while ago. Um, I'm not sure what the original source was, but I, I just love the old English of it. Um, to every gallon of birch water, put a quart of honey, well stirred together, then boil it almost an hour with a few cloves and a little lemon peel, keeping it well scummed. 
When it is sufficiently boiled and become cold, add to it three or four spoonfuls of good ale to make it work. And when the test begins to settle, bottle it up. It is gentle and very harmless in operation within the body, exceedingly sharpens the appetite. Being drunk and possum. Still not sure what that last sentence actually means, being drunk and possum. Um, but if anyone knows, throw it into the, uh, the, the question section in the later uh, piece of this lecture. Okay, getting out of history for a moment. Um, let's jump into noteworthy survival strategies. Um, I'm expecting the first strategy is something that a lot of you will recognize quite quickly. I'm hoping that maybe the next two will be a little less recognizable. Um, so the first one on our list, this is Drosera rotundifolia. This is the round leaf sundew. You can compare this one to uh, the next plant on the list. Um, this guy here, this is Saracenia leucophylla. Um, this is a pitcher plant. This is not native to New England where I, uh, you know, do most of my work. This is native a little bit south of us. Um, for those of you getting into the, you know, kind of, no, not even southern New England, but into the Appalachian region and parts kind of south on the east coast, you probably know the species quite well. It's absolutely one of my favorites. I love this species. Um, I don't actually know what species this is. This is a hybrid that appeared at Garden in the Woods back when I was working there. It was um, collected seed, grew it out. God knows what the parentage is. Um, and here is the New England native. This is Saracenia purpurea. In my region of Massachusetts, if you're looking at a pitcher plant, this is the one you're seeing. There's, there's no other native ones here, although we plant others anyway. Um, the connection that I think a lot of you have probably already picked up on between these pitcher plants and the sundew is that they're insectivorous. Um, carnivorous, specifically towards insects, although I hear that they'll uh, digest the occasional frog, too. So what these plants are doing is they've adapted to grow in areas where nutrients are strictly limited. Um, it's mostly nitrogen that we put up to this, and in many cases, the limiting factor is, is not actually the availability of nitrogen, or at least not in the strict sense, but in the ability of the plants to pick up that nitrogen. Um, and what I mean by this is a lot of these are growing in bog regions, um, areas with very, very low pH, um, very acidic soils. And what happens when you get into these sort of acidic soils is nitrogen gets bound up in the soil and the plants are unable to access it. Um, so it's not that nitrogen isn't there, although in some cases that's also part of the problem. It's that the plants can't actually get their hands on it. Hands. Well, you get the idea. The roots on it. Um, so what these plants have done was developed a way to acquire nitrogen without, you know, pulling it through their roots. And that's where this insectivorous strategy comes in. Um, insects have a lot of nitrogen in them. And these plants have developed ways to trap insects, digest them, and then extract the nitrogen out of them in order to grow better. So let's, let's go back a few. So looking at this Drosera, um, what you're looking at here are a number of little kind of sticky tendrils. And they look like droplets of water. Um, and especially on a dry day, if an insect is looking for a drink, they could very well look at these droplets and say, oh, there's a good source of water. I can drink that. It's not a huge pool. And they'll go to a drink on it, and then they get stuck. Um, and once they get stuck, this plant will slowly, not all that slowly, um, slowly by our point of view, quite quickly by the, uh, the plant's point of view, will we'll curl around that insect and will then digest it and, and acquire its nitrogen. Pitcher plants do something similar, but in a different sort of way. If you look at this picture on the right here, um, you will see these downward pointing hairs within the pitcher itself. And um, what you can imagine, if you put yourself into the body of, say, a fly, you know, a very small insect, you can climb down these downward pointed hairs quite easily. You know, they're all pointed in the direction you're moving. Um, imagine trying to climb back up them, and you're kind of trying to climb into all these pointy spikes makes it much more challenging. Um, so the insects will be attracted to this pitcher plant by a variety of different compounds that are, are sitting around in there that smell good to them. Um, they'll climb down in there, realize that there's no, you know, kind of rotting meat or food for them to eat. They try climbing back out and they can't get out. Um, these downward pointing hairs make it almost impossible for them and eventually they get exhausted and they fall into the water below. Um, and within that water is a variety of compounds that will then go ahead and digest that insect and, again, extract the nitrogen. The added interesting part of this, if you look on the left here, um, this kind of middle picture, what you're seeing there is a pitcher plant in early spring. Um, this is probably, I'd say, maybe in my neck of the woods, I'd say probably about three weeks away from where we currently are. Um, in another month's time or so, they should look about like this. And if you look closely, you'll notice that all those pitchers, um, both the ones that are, are brightly, you know, kind of are red on the bottom and the big, tall green ones in back are closed. 
None of those are actually open. Um, none of them are yet carnivorous. Um, look at the ones that are open towards the bottom and you can see those are actually last year's pitchers. And the reason for this is that this plant not only eats insects, but it needs insects to be the pollinator. Um, you know, going back to our flower here, you need a pollinating insect to come and visit that flower in order to pick up the pollen and move it from one plant to the next. Um, and so the insect does not want to eat its pollinators, or it kind of does want to eat its pollinators, but not until they've done their job. So in the early season, it produces these flattened, non-carnivorous leaves. Um, it does that. It produces flowers. The flowers bloom. The pollinator has done its job. And then all these um, pitchers start to open up and will then start eating all the pollinators and other insects as well. It's a devious strategy. Okay, a different sort of strategy, um, non-insectivorous. Um, see if you can't figure out what connects the next couple of plants. We've got Dicentric cucularia here. This is Dutchman's britches. This is a... Uh, one of our native um, bleeding hearts. We've also got Carolina spring beauty, Claytonia caroliniana, um, a little less common than Claytonia virginica, which is another um, spring beauty that is usually just called spring beauty. Um, we've got trout lily, Erythronium americanum, and we've got anemonella, um, Thelictrum thelictroides. Um, yes, I do have one more. And finally, bloodroot, um, Sanguinaria canadensis. So I can hear you all yelling at your screens right now. Um, the, the connecting point on all of these plants is these are all what we would call spring ephemerals. Um, and what that means is that they've developed a strategy to make um, take advantage of the fact that a lot of our forests around here are dominated by deciduous trees. So deciduous trees in the forest means that they're going to you know, drop their leaves and fall. So during the winter, um, and more importantly right about now, um, there is a lot of light hitting the forest floor, a lot more than you'll see in the summertime when all of the oaks and the maples and the birches have produced big leaves. And that means that what these plants have done is they've developed the ability to come out very early in the spring, and spring ephemeral. Um, they take advantage of the fact that even in, you know, a deep, dark forest, it's pretty bright right now. So they're picking up a lot of light, um, taking full advantage of as much photosynthetic material as they can. Um, and then they pretty much hit the fast forward button compared to all the other plants in, in our typical flora. Um, these species will all bloom early in the season. They will all produce fruit early in the season, and they will all go dormant early in the season. And the reason for that is that they come up now when there's lots of light available. They take full advantage of the light. Um, they produce their flowers. They produce their fruits. They get dispersed all while the light is still available. And then once, you know, light becomes a, a, an important commodity that they can't get their hands on, they just go dormant and wait till next spring rolls around. Um, what they've done is to kind of create a strategy that's based on time. Um, instead of being stronger than other plants or able to grow taller or faster or anything like that, they just come out when there aren't a lot of other plants competing for light. Um, it's a unique advantage that we find in New England as kind of the epicenter of, of ephemerals. Um, we have more ephemerals in New England than anywhere else in the world. Um, there are ephemerals elsewhere. You find them on the west coast of North America. You find them in China and Asia and other areas where they have similar genera to our, our North American flora, but different species, clearly. Um, but New England's got everyone else beat for ephemerals. It's the one thing that I can say we got on top. Okay, so next strategy. I'm expecting this one's going to be a little harder to pick up on. So, again, let's play the same game. What, what connects these next couple of plants? So we've got wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. We've got black-eyed Susan, Rebecca herta. Um, we've got two species of lobelia, um, lobelia syphilitica, the blue lobelia, and lobelia cardinalis, um, the, the cardinal flower. Um, and finally, the last one I threw into this mix is spotted bee balm, Monerta punctata. So the connection on all of these species, um, here, let me, let me kind of pose a question before I give it away to you. Um, I think this one is probably the most common. How many folks have planted columbine in the past? You, you went to the nursery, you bought Aquilegia canadensis, it looks fantastic. You take it home, you planted it. Um, it looked great for the first year, maybe did pretty well the second year. By the third or fourth year, it started to just kind of disappear on you. I don't know if anyone's saying yes, but I'm hoping that you are. Um, so what's going on there and what connects all of these plants is that these are all what are considered short-lived perennials. Um, they're not an annual, 
And none of these are a true biennial, although there's a little bit of an argument for Lobelia being a biennial, but even that is a, it's a, it's not really a fair argument. Um, these are all short-lived perennials. They tend to live somewhere between two and four years, depending on each species. Um, and after that, they disappear. And what that means is that if you were like me and you planted um, black-eyed Susan, you know, 20 years ago, um, and you have what you think is a 20-year-old black-eyed Susan, what you're likely looking at is a two- to four-year-old black-eyed Susan that is likely the, you know, eighth or tenth generation of the original plants that you planted. So what it means is when you've got a short-lived perennial species, but you've got, you know, something that is not going to just, these are plants that will last for many, many years on the landscape. These will outlive all of us. Um, and the way that they do that is they're very good at, at producing seed, distributing that seed, and that seed is very good at germinating in place and growing on to produce a mature plant. Um, it's kind of the way you'll find our native annuals are, are able to persist on the landscape. For those of you who know partridge pea, um, it's a plant that you can plant once and see for many, many years, despite the fact that you know it's an annual species. Um, these are quite similar in that way. And it gives them certain advantages over another perennial species. Um, compare this to something like lupin or, um, you know, a, a blue stem or baptisia. Um, the advantage that these have is that they're fast. Um, they can grow very quickly. They often almost always bloom the very first season, something that none of our short-lived, or sorry, long-lived perennials will do. Um, and they can persist in areas where there's a lot of disturbance. What that means is that they're very good at handling things like roadside conditions, they're good at handling nature's version of a roadside, which might be a scoured riverbank um, or areas where you get trampling from, you know, wildlife. Um, areas where the crown of the plant is crushed and dies, but the seed bank can persist and then re-sprout. Um, it also makes them very useful for what I describe as young gardens. If you're planting a, uh, let's say you're planting a meadow and you're putting in things like little blue stem and baptisia and lupin and, and prairie drop seed, these are all slow growing species. Um, if you are to simply seed those into a meadow and wait a year or two, what you're going to find is a whole lot of really small little blue stem and a whole lot of really big, happy mullein and chickweed and dock and God knows what else, you know, weeds you've got in your area. If you throw these plants into it, these short-lived perennials, what's great is that they will, they will germinate and grow as quickly as many of those weed species will. Um, and they will persist quite readily, and they will pretty much take over that meadow for the first three, four, you know, five years. The nice thing, though, is that as they continue to grow, and as your little blue stem starts to put on more root growth and starts to kind of bulk up, um, eventually those, those long-lived perennials, those slow-growing species, will kind of win the battle. Um, though they're kind of slow about going it, every year they don't need to start all over again. You know, the root system from last year is there again the year after and the year after and the year after. So in time, you tend to find that the short-lived perennials tend to start to disappear in favor of the long-term perennials. It means that you can have a mix of both. It also means that these become pretty much your weed seed bank. Um, so when I used to work at Garden in the Woods, we had our meadow full of a lot of, you know, long-lived perennial species like the baptisias and the prairie drop seeds. But on the corner of the meadow and on the edges, they would often get trampled. Um, you know, no matter what you do in a botanical garden, people are going to be, you know, kind of walking off the trails. Even when they don't mean to, they'll occasionally step in the garden. Um, and so there's a lot of damage right on the kind of trail edges. And that's where these species persisted. Because every time somebody stepped on and crushed a lupin, there'd be a little bit of columbine seed waiting to re-sprout and to come to life. And this is something that anyone can do at home. Um, you start planting these in your garden and they become your weeds, um, in which case, instead of having to weed out every dock you see, you just decide, hey, do I want that loop in there or do I want the cardinal flower there? And you can kind of edit. Okay, um, I think the last of my survival strategies, this is skunk cabbage. I think a lot of people are, are to some extent familiar with this plant's um, survival strategy, though maybe you don't quite understand exactly what's going on. Um, this is the first plant to bloom every spring in New England. They have been blooming for a while now. In, in many cases, they're already passing their flower and are, are starting the initial stages of producing a fruit, which will be a while before that matures. Um, they have amazing flowers. This, this structure is just um, beautiful in its own way. This is the survival strategy I'm talking about. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. If you catch it in early spring, you'll see these plants coming out of the snow. And it's almost like somebody came in there with a hair dryer and kind of blew it right around this plant. There'll be this little kind of 
moat of, of lack of snow right around the plant itself. What these plants are able to do is to actually metabolically produce heat. Um, it's not a lot of heat, um, but it's enough where the inside of that flower is distinctly warmer than the outside ambient temperatures. And the reason the plant does this is it's providing a really nice home for insects, um, specifically flies, a really good place to spend the night. And so flies know this. They take good advantage of this. So they will fly over to this thing, especially in the later part of the day. Um, they might be going in there to, you know, to collect pollen and to eat and because they're attracted to the flower itself. But come nighttime, you know, that's a nice warm spot, so they'll spend the whole night there. The next day they fly off and they do their, their fly-like things. Um, and then as the night's approaching, they find another flower to go spend the night in. And what that means is that they've gone from one flower, gotten themselves coated in pollen, and then gone to another flower where they spend the night. Very, very good chances that that process is going to move pollen from one flower to the next. Um, it's a great strategy for taking advantage of the fact that there's really not a lot flying around this time of year. There's, you know, a good side and a bad side to that. Um, the bad side is clear. You know, you don't have a lot of insects flying around. There's a lot less insects that might visit you as a flower and move your pollen around. Um, but the advantage is that those insects that are flying around don't have a lot of other plants to go visit. So if they visit one skunk cabbage, there's a pretty good chance they're going to go visit another one. Um, you know, imagine if you uh, visited a, as a flower, you know, as a pollinator, you visited skunk cabbage and then went and visited a maple tree. Um, you know, there's no good pollination going on there. You can't take the pollen from a skunk cabbage and move it onto a maple and see seed production. Um, so ensuring that an insect goes from one individual of a species to another individual of the species is an important part of successful pollination. And this heat is a really good way to do it. This is the inside of the flower here. You can see that the spathe is what we think of as the flower, that outer structure. And inside is a structure we call the spadix, which is kind of the important part of the flower from the sexual structure's point of view. Um, and that's what will eventually, you know, swell and produce the fruit. Um, and inside there is where you would get your kind of your nice warm little spot to spend the night. I lied. We've got one more survival strategy. Um, I'm pretty sure this is my last survival strategy. And then we're going to move on to another topic. This is Astra Nova Angle, or Symphiotrichum Nova Angle, depending on whose taxonomy you want to pay attention to these days. Um, this is the New England Aster. And this strategy is something that you'll find runs well past New England Aster into other Asters, into goldenrods, into a variety of other species. Um, this is New England Aster planted in a garden in a manner that I don't recommend planting New England Aster. Um, and for years, when I was working in the kind of what I'd call the traditional horticulture industry, um, I would have New England asters available in my retail area, and I would, you know, kind of make them available to people, and they would buy them, and they would take them home, and then they would come back to me, and they'd say, you know what, I really don't like the way the New England asters leaves all die out on the bottom. It looks terrible. You know, I just don't understand why it keeps doing that. Maybe I'm not watering it enough, or I'm watering it too much, or so forth. And people would always, you know, think that they were doing something wrong in the fact that the leaves would often die out on the bottom of this plant. Um, and you would get a plant that looks good on top and not so good on the bottom, and that really didn't work in, in a lot of garden settings. Okay, now imagine you are a New England aster, or in this case, a flea bane, and this is natural conditions. This is where it grows. So, um, think about this. What is the value of leaves on the bottom of these plants? Um, this is not New England aster. This is Origeron pulchellus. This is a Robin's planting flea bane. It's closely related. It's another aster family plant. Um, and you can imagine having leaves produced on the bottom, you know, that it's a lot of work to produce a leaf. It takes a lot of energy. Um, and then to maintain that leaf, and in this case, you know, what would the leaves be doing? Leaves are solar collectors. They're solar panels. They're there to photosynthesize. And when you're in a meadow condition like this, having leaves in the top, you know, two inches or the bottom two inches of your plant is useless. It's just wasted energy. So this plant and a variety of other meadow species have developed a strategy where as they mature and as they get taller, those lower leaves just kind of disappear. They're not needed anymore. And this means that if you're planting these plants in the sort of garden settings where you plant them and surround them in 18 inches of mulch, all you're going to do is see dead leaves, um, which is why I recommend companion planting. Um, Plant them a little bit more like they would naturally grow in the wild. Either plant them in meadow gardens or make sure when you plant these species that you surround them with low-growing species that can fill up that basal area. You want things like, here we're looking at a solidago species. This is another natural conditions one. Um, in garden settings, you could do something like Pacaraurea. 
um, the running ground cell. You could do things like low growing strawberries or raspberries. Um, you could do things like Carex pensylvanica. There's a variety of really good kind of ground covers that you could use, just companion plant. Think about asters mixed in with other species that'll stay low, fill in those kind of middle areas, and then the aster pops out above and plays that kind of show on top. Um, and then you're not wasting space with lower leaves that don't do anything. Um, and the plant is not showing off a survival strategy that people don't tend to like seeing in a kind of mulch style garden setting. Okay, let's get into some flavors. Um, I've always had a soft spot for the eating side of things. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with this idea of the three sisters, this companion planting idea with corn, beans, and squash, um, you know, greater than the sum of their parts. It's a darn good idea and one that I think we could really be employing in, in more varied sort of agricultural settings. Um, within the New England flora, we have what I, I tend to refer to as the two brothers. Um, if you want to throw a third brother into there, you could probably throw in a wild strawberry or, or a, a ground bean. But for the moment, let's go with the two brothers. Um, what we've got here are two wonderfully tasty root crops. Um, on the left there, that darker one, that's Apios Americana. It's the American ground nut. On the right, the lighter colored one, that's a little more on the knobby side of things, that's Helianthus tuberosus, um, Jerusalem artichoke or sunchoke. So starting with Apios, um, Apios is a native twining um, legume. It's, it's in the pea family. You can see in those flowers that pea family structure to it. It is a nitrogen fixer. Um, so it's, it's quite a useful plant if you're trying to kind of bring nitrogen into your soil. It's a climbing species that will happily climb. In this case, it's climbing on a fence post. Um, but in another slide or two, you'll see it climbing on plants themselves. Um, what's great about this species, not only is it a beautiful flowering plant, um, but the roots on it are absolutely fantastic in flavor. This is what they look like if you actually care for them a bit. This was when I was growing them in a container specifically for food production. Um, and what I mean by care for them a bit is I gave them a good amount of compost, so, you know, rich soils. I spaced them out so they had room to grow into these, you know, kind of nice almost golf ball size, you know, kind of pieces. And I made sure they were kept, you know, adequately moist during the season. It's not a lot of work. Um, and you can get a lot of food out of these. These make the absolute best chip I have ever had in my life. Um, it is, it's crunchy um, the, the same way a potato chip could be. Um, but it's got this wonderful, rich, sweet nuttiness to it that's just phenomenal. Um, the flavor on these is like somebody took a potato and crossed it with a roasted chestnut. Um, it's got that starchy potato-like kind of flavor, but it's also got that distinct nuttiness um, that gives it that name, ground nut. Um, these are absolutely wonderful in flavor. The other one of our two brothers, come on screen. There we go. Um, the other one of our two brothers is the sunchoke. Um, I think sunchoke is probably a better name than Jerusalem artichoke. It's not an artichoke and it's not from Jerusalem, um, but it is a sunflower and sunchoke. Um, and it's still got the choke. You know, it's the artichoke that it got its name from is for the flavor. Um, instead of uh, crossing your potato with a roasted chestnut, imagine crossing a potato with an artichoke and you've got the flavor of sunchokes. Um, they have a distinct um, kind of sweet flavor to them. Definitely on that kind of artichokey, slightly nutty side. Um, sometimes they're described in, in a slightly kind of piney sort of direction. I've never found that to be very accurate, but from what I understand, there's some cultivars, some um, varieties that are more on the piney side, other ones that are more on the artichokey side, and other ones that are a little more on the kind of delicate, um, just a little more potato-like or carrot-like. Um, I'm, I'm planning this year on growing four different varieties and kind of going through a taste test and seeing how they all differ. Um, in the past, I've always grown a single one that was, well, wasn't a single variety, a variety of, of different varieties, I guess. They were seed grown. I had a lot of genetic diversity and the flavor was all over the place. Still quite wonderful. So these um, plants contain a compound called inulin in them. It's something that I think people should get to know. Inulin has some advantages and some disadvantages like just about everything else in the world. Um, it is something that many of our bodies, um, depending on you and your gut flora, um, some people can digest it fully. That's the rarer case. Some people really can't digest it at all. That's also the rarer case. And the most of us are somewhere stuck in the middle where we can kind of partially digest this compound inulin. And when we only partially digest it, our gut flora takes over and does the rest of the work. Um, and there's byproducts of that. And the byproducts are carbon dioxide and sometimes methane. Um, which is a nice way of saying it's going to get you gassy. Um, people tend to get pretty farty when they eat sunchokes. Um, some people get this quite strongly. 
Some people will say, I've ate these for years and I had no idea that did it. It never affected me at all. Um, I have met one person in all my years of recommending this plant who actually got a stomach ache from eating these. Everyone else is somewhere between the it doesn't affect me at all and I get really gassy and I never feed it to my in-laws. Inulin's kind of advantage side of things is that it's been showing some very interesting value for diabetics. Um, if anyone out there is diabetic, this is a plant to put on your short list. Glycemic index of a potato is somewhere in the 80 range. Um, this is a starchy root vegetable, similar in many ways to potato, except the glycemic index on a sunchoke is 11. Um, so just on that alone, this is a great replacement for potatoes um, for those of you looking to eat a, you know, a diabetic's diet. Um, this, the second piece of it, though, is that inulin has started showing um, an actual direct ability to help a body to regulate blood sugar levels. Um, this is something that has only really started to be studied more regularly. Um, I believe it was Cornell that produced a study recently, but I might be misquoting that. Um, but hop on the Google, type in inulin diabetics, and you're going to probably find the, the article that I'm referring to. Um, and what they're showing is that um, the ingestion of inulin helps um, to regulate blood sugar levels in diabetics past the point where it's just about glycemic index. Um, this plant might actually directly help um, diabetics. It's one you ought to get to know. It might get you gassy, but if it can help you regulate blood sugar levels, I think it's probably a safe bet. Um, and the reason why I put these two together as the two brothers is that I will interplant the two of these. Keep in mind, we're talking companion planting. So I plant my, my sunchokes. I plant my Jerusalem, all right, sorry, my, uh, my ground nuts, and the ground nut will actually climb up the sun choke and use it pretty much as support. I used to grow these in containers. Do I have a picture? I don't have the picture. Um, you can kind of see a container in the back of the right there. Um, I would grow this in a nice big container, and the nice thing is come fall, um, when these plants had started to yellow and the foliage was dying back, we're talking usually October-ish, um, I would go up to that container, I would cut all the foliage off, I would throw it in my compost pile, and I would dump that whole container out, and I'd go rooting through it, looking for nice big tubers, um, stuff that looked kind of like these guys here. And all the big ones would get packed in some sand and thrown in the root cellar, and I'd be eating them all winter long. Um, and all the little ones that were too much trouble to deal with would go right back into that pot with some fresh compost and some soil, and I would do it again next year. Um, and I would constantly, you know, once you plant these once, you never need to plant them again. Um, in fact, putting these in the ground is something you want to kind of decide whether or not it's the right place to do that. Um, this is something that I've grown in raised beds. I've grown this in just kind of garden settings. Um, but especially the sun choke, the guy on the right there, um, can be very vigorous and hard to remove once established. So don't put it in a small space or any area where you want to kind of interplant it with other species that aren't, you know, close to as vigorous. Um, APO is, is often just as vigorous, but a bit better behaved. I've, I've found I can interplant that in garden settings a little more readily um, than I can sun choke. Still quite a vigorous plant and, you know, twining species that'll climb on whatever it's in front of. Um, but I'd still say, you know, less vigorous than the sun choke. Okay, um, let's get out of eating and into drinking. Um, we have a variety of wonderful teas in New England. I just want to check my time. Oh, running a little behind. Going to keep moving here. Um, so spice bush, um, this is big on the list. I've, I've, I'm a huge fan of this species. It is not blooming yet, but I'm seeing um, bud swell on a lot of the species here in Massachusetts. Flowers in the early season before the leaves come out and has a distinctly spicy sort of scent and smell and flavor to it. Um, really quite nice as a cup of tea. Sassafras, another wonderful tea plant. Um, if you're harvesting roots, you're likely looking for the medicinal saffron, but if you're just harvesting the twigs, uh, medicinal value on this one is, is quite limited, but the flavor on it is really quite fantastic. Um, you can also collect those leaves and, and dry them and crumble them up and use them as a thickener in soups and stews. We already mentioned yellow birch um, or black birch. In that case, sweet birches. Uh, makes a wonderful tea, makes an even better hot toddy. Monarda didyma, this is the one that is usually just referred to as bee bomb, sometimes scarlet bee bomb. Um, this is probably the most common bee bomb in the horticultural industry, though less common um, seen naturally occurring in New England. In fact, uh, you got to really be in the right place to see this growing you know, naturally in New England. You usually see Monarda fistulosa, um, wild bergamot. These are all absolutely wonderful tea plants. 
um, each of them valuable in its own different sort of way. A lot of the woody species, I recommend collecting small twigs and simmering them in some kind of hot water for, you know, three to five minutes until the flavor develops. Um, these herbaceous ones like Monarda didyma or some that aren't mentioned here, things like pignanthemums or the other bee bombs or agastaches. Um, you can either use fresh leaves, you can use flowers, or you could dry it down for later use, which is quite nice. All right. Um, so sandwiched between the edible section of this um, lecture and the poison section of the lecture is the powerful poison with a question mark. Um, I've always gotten a kick out of this plant from the kind of poison point of view. If, if you're on you know, social media or if you're talking to people, you often hear it referred to that this is extremely poisonous. Keep your children away. It's out to get you. Um, better be careful around the U. It's a very, very poisonous plant. Um, it's a partially true statement at most. Um, the, the berries themselves, which are not actually berries, but we can call them berries, are not actually poisonous. It's the seed inside that is. In fact, the berry here, this fleshy arrow that we're calling a berry, is actually quite edible and quite tasty. Um, a little gelatinous in texture, quite sweet, um, really quite nice. The seed on the inside, however, contains a compound called taxol, which is highly poisonous. Um, in small doses, it's actually been shown to have some really interesting anti-cancer um, qualities to it, and there's some testing going on for its uses medicinally, but this is not something you want to just go eating. Um, this is a, a highly toxic compound um, that is, is present within this seed. The interesting thing about this kind of, you know, claim of poison here is that if you were to eat this entire um, berry, you know, seed and all, you'd probably be perfectly fine. Um, the seed itself is encapsulated in a strong seed coat, and the compound that is so poisonous is within that seed coat. The danger comes in if you manage to crack that seed coat and then swallow that seed. Um, or if your stomach acids were super powered and were able to break down that seed before it passed through you. Um, so there is some truth to the statement that this is a poisonous plant. There is this poison within the seed here called taxol that you definitely do not want to be ingesting. It's also a true statement to say that this is an edible species. It's about as dangerous as a potato or an eggplant or a tomato. Um, eat the right part, don't eat the wrong part, know what you're doing, and if you'd rather be safe than sorry, then don't eat it. Um, that being said, this is not a plant that's out to get your children. And what I often recommend to folks when it comes to protecting children from things like poisonous plants is I think education is the most important thing we can do. Um, you know, sheltering our kids has value, and it's something that I think people, you know, can decide when to use that and when not to. Um, but especially as children mature and they start, you know, being able to learn these sort of lessons, it's great to be able to explain to them the importance of knowing what you're eating and what you're looking for and why you might be able to eat something like a tomato berry but not a tomato leaf. Um, and I think this is a great, you know, chance for education. Um, not that I'm saying you should plant this around the toddler's garden and leave them unattended. Um, but don't forget the fact that it's not poisonous if you're not eating the wrong part of it. And this is something that we need to look at from a broader point of view than simply pointing at it, saying it's poison, and never planting it. Um, Texas canadensis is an absolutely wonderful plant that I really would love to see planted more often in the right conditions. Unfortunately, it's quite tasty to deer as well. So if you have a lot of deer around, you don't have the right conditions. Okay. Um, this is a great little piece of poisonous knowledge. Um, these are the acteas. Um, in this case, these are the baneberries. On the left here, you're looking at red baneberry, Actea rubra. On the white, you see um, white, or sorry, on the right, you see white baneberry, often referred to as doll's eyes, Actea pachypoda. Um, I've always said if you're looking for a single native plant to scare young children with, Actea pachypoda is probably the winner. Um, it's creepy looking. It's kind of got a whole bunch of eyes looking at you. It's not what no, most people call a pretty plant. Um, but interesting without a doubt. So the poisonous part of this is that um, if you think about it, you know, we know that, say, uh, you know, Texas canadensis seeds are poisonous. Um, and the reason we know that is not because of vigorous medical testing. Um, that has been done more recently. Um, but before we were able to do these tests and identify kind of poisons, it was a pretty much trial and error sort of thing. And so back in 1903, there was a botanist by the name of Alice Bacon who wanted to determine exactly whether or not acteas were poisonous and how poisonous they might be. Um, so she tested it, um, and then she wrote about it. And in 1903 English, it's got a wonderful sound to it. Um, so bear with me as you hear a story. This is Alice's ba Alice Bacon's writing from 1903. 
In the fear that children, attracted by the beauty of the fruit, might eat to their own undoing, an experiment in the qualities of the berries was entered upon with the following result. A small dose was taken after the midday meal, as caution, caution seemed advisable. But the only effect noted was a slight burning in the stomach. The question, however, of children eating the forbidden fruit was definitely settled once and for all, as no child, youth, sane adult, nor even a hungry schoolboy would ever devour it from deliberate choice. The taste is most nauseous, bitter, puckery. Indeed, several even more drastic adjectives might have been applied with perfect truth. A little note here, it says, after a small series of on increased doses, Miss Bacon settled on six berries before recording the following. Half an hour afterward, all curiosity on the subject of red baneberry was abundantly satisfied, for this one experimenter at least. Suddenly the mind became confused, and there was a total disability to recollect anything distinctly or arrange ideas with any consistency. Words seemed to utter themselves independently. For a few minutes, there was great dizziness, the body seeming to swing off into space while the blue spots, these were described as a visual hallucination, changed to dancing sparks of fire. The lips and throat became parched, swallowing was difficult, there was intense burning in the stomach with gaseous eruptions. Um, and this is what Alice was telling us from 1903. I'm reading out of uh, one of Bill Kalina's books. If anyone doesn't have his books, um, it's, it's listed as William Kalina, not Bill. Um, but he wrote a book on growing native perennials that is absolutely wonderful. And if you read up on Actaeus, you'll find this writing from there. These are wonderful species. Maybe not wonderful for eating. Here we go. Um, but wonderful in the garden. I think it get a little bit confusing. Um, so on the left here is still red baneberry. On the right here is still white baneberry or doll's eyes. But what you're looking at here is the white form of red baneberry and the red form of the doll's eyes. And what you can see if you look closely... See the peduncle. Um, that's word of the day for today. Peduncle is that, that stem that actually holds the fruit in place. Notice on the left, the peduncles on red baneberry are quite thin. The peduncles on the, on the doll's eyes are quite thick. And as you go to the next screen and see the color forms, you'll notice that the red peduncles are still quite thin and the white peduncles are still quite thick, even though the colors have swapped. Um, so if you're ever unsure what you're looking at, go for the structure of the plant instead of the color, and it'll tell you the truth. So Aconitum uncinatum, this is monkshood, common monkshood, garden monkshood. This one's just straight up poisonous. Um, there's no edible value here. There's, there's nothing you should be eating. Um, there is some medicinal value here. Um, but the reason I like to talk about this one is this is a species that every couple of years you hear a story that likes to make the rounds about some gardener in some unknown place who touched this plant and then died of multiple organ failure. It's a great story. The only problem with it is it's just completely untrue. Um, you can touch this plant all you want. You can rub it on your skin. You can, you know, sniff it. It's perfectly safe to be around it. Um, what you don't want to do is ingest it. You do not want to eat it, and that means if you're rubbing it all over your hands, you probably don't want to go eating a sandwich afterwards unless you went and washed your hands first. Um, there is some powerful poison within this plant, but it's something that needs to be ingested. It's not something that can be absorbed through the skin. Um, so it's perfectly safe to have it in your garden, but if you have dogs that like to eat plants or kids that like to eat plants, or if you have a strong urge to eat your plants, this is probably not the plant for you. Um, that being said, it's an absolutely beautiful species. Um, blooms in the late season after a lot of others. We have a, a, a more native species, if I could call it that, for the New England area at least, um, Aconitum novoborosensis, the New York ironweed, which blooms more in the midsummer. Um, wonderful, wonderful plants, really cool things, um, but yes, powerful poison. Okay, some strange and stupid places. Um, I'm just going to kind of go on the fact that I'd say the typical American lung is a stupid place. Um, this is something that needs to change already. Um, we're stuck in this weird little conundrum where we've seemed to think this is the thing we have to do. Um, there must be this non-native monoculture of this thing in front of every one of our houses that requires a ton of work and a ton of inputs in order to make it grow. Um, and that's what I think needs to change already. I think there's some value in lawns as, as, you know, kind of soccer, you know, kind of fields and as a gathering point for the town where you might have the town farmer's market or whatever. Um, but the idea that every one of us needs one of these in front of our houses is an idea that I think is stupid and needs to go all the way over. So with that in mind, I want native alternatives. Um, and here's a good one. This is a plant that looks like a lawn. Um, it's not actually a grass, it's a sedge, but who cares, it's grass-like. Um, this is the same plant twice, unmowed on the left, mowed on the right. Within about a week of taking this picture, the, that lighter green color on the right had darkened up to that darker green color you see on the left as 
you know, photosynthesis occurred in these lower stems. This is Carex pennsylvanica. This is our native Pennsylvania sedge. And the great thing about this as compared to the non-native, you know, European turf grasses is that this plant has amazing wildlife value. There are 36 different species of our native butterflies and moths that will feed on this plant in their caterpillar phase. Um, this is a plant that naturally grows under pine trees in New England. And what that means is it can handle thin soils, it can handle shade, um, and it's a rhizomatic spreader which means if you dig a hole in the middle of it, it fills right back in. You don't have to reseed or do anything like that. Um, this is an effective lawn alternative for a number of places in New England if you want it to still look like a lawn. Won't handle the same sort of abuse that a European turf grass lawn will. Um, this is not gonna play you know, a replacement on a soccer field or on the town green. Um, that being said, if your lawn is really just about aesthetics and you're really not playing soccer on it, this is a fine choice for you. This is it left completely unmowed. This is as tall as it'll ever get. Um, if you do want to mow it, you only need to mow it once a year. Um, it puts on all of its growth in early spring. So if you mow it in kind of early summer, it's done growing for the season and you don't need to mow again. As far as I'm concerned, this is my absolute favorite lawn. This is, I think, the lawn of the future in New England. This is Fergaria virginiana, the wild strawberry. Um, this is a vigorous spreading species. Um, what that means is it's not one that plays well with other delicate species, but it also, on the flip side of that, means it can handle abuse. Um, this is what I'm doing at my home for the lawn. Um, and this is digging up to two dogs, one that likes to dig holes, um, free-range chickens, and the fact that we are trampling our lawn every day as we move on it to get into our garden beds. Um, this plant can handle abuse. It also feeds us quite wonderfully um, and feeds wildlife even more effectively. Notice if you look closely in the second picture how ratty those leaves look. Um, you don't see it when you step back and look at the, you know, that kind of picture on the left. Um, but on the right, you can see that those leaves have been fed upon. Um, if the Carex was host site for 36 different species, for Gary is host site for 87. Um, there's not a single herbaceous genus that is more valuable than Fregaria um, in New England other than goldenrods. They're, they're top of the list. Fregaria is number two on the list. Nothing else beats out these two species. Um, wildlife value on this one is phenomenal. Um, and that's just the leaves. Don't forget the flowers are still good bee food, and the berries obviously are good for us or for any wildlife that gets to it before we do. Okay, let's do some strange sex here. Um, this is Jack in the Pulpit. This is a wonderful plant and just phenomenally interesting in the fact that it's an odd plant from a sexual point of view. Um, what we're looking at here is the flowers. This is what most people think of when they hear Jack in the pulpit. What they don't tend to pay enough attention to is the fruits. Um, we've got a beautiful fruiting season on the Jack in the pulpit. It's not just a spring plant. It looks great in fall. Um, the sex stuff comes in in how we go from flower to fruit. If you slice open the flower, you're going to look at one of these two things. And what you're seeing on the right here is male flowers, and on the left are female flowers. Um, thank you, Carol Gracie, by the way, for putting this together. Um, and what happens is in most plant cases, you find a plant that's either male or female, or you find plants where the flowers are what is called perfect and they have both male and female structures. Um, and for the most part, when plants are male or female, they kind of stick around with that. You either have a female winterberry or you have a male winterberry. Jack and the Blue Pit doesn't really do that. They're much more fluid. Um, they start their life off as a male every time. Um, and the reason for that is in the plant world, the men have it easier. Um, think about what a male has to do as compared to a female. Um, the males produce pollen. Pollen is small. It doesn't take a lot of energy to produce it. Um, and it's something that any young plant is capable of doing. Think about being a female. You've got to produce um, female flowers, these ovaries on the left here, that eventually turn into this fruit. Um, and this fruit is a large investment of energy. Um, it takes a lot to be able to produce these berries, a lot more energy than is taken to produce a little bit of pollen. So the way that these plants work is they start off as male. Um, they produce male flowers, small investment of energy, and as they're doing that, they're, they're, they're photosynthesizing, they're storing energy in their roots, and they're doing this for a good couple of years until they've built up enough energy to produce fruit. At that point, they will switch sexes, and they will no longer be male. They will produce female flowers, and if they are then pollinated, they will produce the fruit that requires so much energy. And immediately after producing fruit, they'll switch back to being male and take the easy job again. 
And this is why oftentimes people will realize that their, their jack in the pulpit is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it produces a beautiful fruit display. And then they'll wonder why it's doing so poorly the next year. It's not doing poorly. It just took up all its energy producing fruit, and it's kind of going through its reset phase, and it's gotten small again on you. Um, a way to kind of cheat and tell whether you've got one or the other without actually opening up the flowers to count your leaves. On the left here is a male plant. On the right is a female. Um, and the way I can tell that is the male plants produce a single leaf, whereas the female plants produce a double leaf. Um, this is not 100% accurate, but I found it to be somewhere in the 90% range. Um, it's accurate most of the time, and you can check this by actually opening up the flower to confirm. Um, but you'll find that the more mature plants will often produce two leaves, they have female flowers, and they will then produce your fruit. And there we see it. There's our, our two leaves with uh, the green fruits, not yet mature. You can see the size of that plant, nice and big, um, female plant. The lady slippers, or, or orchids in general, are just mean in terms of the way they interact with pollinators. Um, there was a great book out there wrote, um, oh, God, I can't remember the name, something to the extent of the strange world of orchid sex. Um, and it goes through orchids across the entire planet and the different ways that they produce seed. Um, our native ones are a little less mean than some of the, the non-natives. Um, that being said, they're still not all that nice to the native pollinators. Um, what they do is they produce a flower that is, in, in other words, it's a trap. Um, the flower looks like there's some good pollen or some nectar in there. The bee comes up to it. It lands. It kind of falls into this, this slipper of the lady slipper, um, and it can't get out, or at least it can't get out easily. Um, and in the process of being in there, it, it gets these pollina stuck to it, um, orchids kind of put all their pollen into this sack that's nice and sticky. Um, and the only way the bee is able to get out of this flower that is not feeding it anything at all is to climb up the backside where you can see that little pollen sack. The pollen gets stuck onto its back. And then when it goes and visits another flower, the first thing it climbs down past is, is the, the stipule, um, where the, the pollen sack will then get to, deposited and the orchid is able to produce its fruit. So the orchid is tricking the bee into thinking that there's food in there and then trapping it once it gets there, not giving it a darn thing. Um, and the bees will then go do it again and again and pollinate the orchids. Um, they do tend to learn, um, but there's always enough bees out there where you can get a couple of them visiting and you do tend to get good um, you know, pollination. Some of our non-native orchids get a lot meaner than that. There are ones that drug bees. There's ones that produce flowers that look like female bees and the, the male bee will try and mate with it and pollinate. There's other ones that will produce flowers that look like male bees, um, and the male bee will then take it as a territorial thing and will attack. Um, there's some amazing orchids out there. Okay, moving along, unexpected beauty. Um, I don't think too many people think of ferns for winter interest, um, but this one does it quite nicely. This is Matusia strithiopterus, the fiddlehead fern. This is the edible species. Um, this is the one, this is how it looks in the summertime. Um, easy an argument for a beautiful, you know, kind of summer show, nice and lush looking. Um, but then as the summer progresses, you get these, um, the fertile fronds starting to form. And as it matures, it eventually dries out and will stand there all winter long looking like this. This is a picture taken during the dormant season. Um, it's got a beautiful sort of, you know, texture and architecture to it that I find quite intriguing. Um, especially considering these form patches and you'll get multiples of these all forming up um, and oftentimes sticking out of the snow. It may not be a big showy hibiscus flower, but nonetheless, especially in the wintertime, this is a cool display. Um, something that I either enjoy on the landscape or will sometimes, you know, cut stems of and bring inside and enjoy inside. Um, not your typical beauty and definitely not your typical beautiful time of year, um, but still quite a nice plant. Unique attractions are fun. Um, we have, as I said, a number of different attractions in New England. Um, this is liquid dambar star. Uh, Styra cephlua, I always get that one confused. Sweet gum, um, native, uh, it's native in New England, although only barely. As you start moving south of New England, you see a whole heck of a lot more of this one. Um, kind of star-shaped leaves, sometimes described as maple-like, but I think they're unique in their own way. Um, this is well, a host plant for the hickory horn devil. Um, this is the largest moth um, north of Mexico. Um, and it produces the largest caterpillar, or I guess we could say the, the caterpillar produces the largest moth, um, but the caterpillar is the largest caterpillar in, in all of North America. Um, these are phenomenal, big, beautiful, funky-looking caterpillars. Um, I have never seen one in person. All I've ever gotten was pictures. So if anyone in the area raises these and wants to show off, I would love to see these. 
Um, I've tried raising them a couple of times without much success. Parthenosis quinquefolia, this is the Virginia creeper, um, a very common uh, liana or woody vine that we find in New England. Um, this is the host plant for the Pandora sphinx moth. Um, this is a very funky uh, moth that produces, the moth itself looks kind of like a stealth bomber, almost kind of camouflaged in coloration. The caterpillar itself has this creepy eye spot on the back of the head, um, supposed to look something, something like a snake, potentially scare off the birds before they decide to eat it. Um, I'm not sure how well it works. It must work well enough because it evolved to develop this eye spot. I found this guy at Garden in the Woods a number of years ago now. Um, this is one of a number of species that will feed on this plant. May apples. Let's let's get off of the uh, the, the herbivores for a second and think about um, dispersal agents. Normally, for dispersers, we think of you know a, a plant that might produce a seed that sticks to us. Think about like a deer walks by, a beggar's tick, it sticks to it. Um, or you think about say birds, you know, eating berries and then pooping out the seeds. It's a good disperser. Um, for may apples, it is an unexpected guess. It's the box turtle. Um, the may apples grow in great box turtle habitat. The box turtles will eat these um, berries, and as they move around and then send the berry back out the other end, um, it comes out with a little shot of fertilizer, and the seeds come out and will happily germinate. Um, I can't imagine box turtles are the most effective um, of dispersers, but they're effective enough where, where this works, and this is quite a happy plant. Um, Prudentsarodna, black cherry. Um, this plant often gets a bad rap for being a weed tree. I don't think it's a fair statement at all. Um, it's a pioneer species. It's one that comes into changing landscapes, often meadows going back towards forest. Um, it's a beautiful plant in its own way. It's an edible plant, and it's a very important pollinator plant or, or herbivore, uh, sorry, wildlife plant. Um, this is within the top five in terms of plants that produce more wildlife value than anything else in New England. One of the many is the Cecropia moth. Um, these are such cool moths, um, such cool caterpillars. Looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. I'd almost think this was fake if it wasn't a, a picture of a, an insect that, that we raised when I was at Garden in the Woods. And, and I, I love the fact that we raised them because it made taking pictures really easy. Um, the clouded or cloudless sulfur, depending on who you want to argue with, um, feeds on Senna hibericarpa. Um, you notice the camouflage on this. Um, this this, this yellow and black um, kind of caterpillar that hangs out on yellow flowers with black stamens. This is a plant that has a, a strong connection with ants um, and will the ants will often defend the plant from would-be uh, predators um, or herbivores. Um, the cloudless sulfur has, has evolved a way to get around that by being well camouflaged. Um, I've not seen these in New England. I don't think they, they range this far north. It's one that we are looking for as a sign of the changing climate. Um, if anyone lives in the New England area or even, you know, just south of New England and knows that these are present, I'd be very interested in hearing from you. All right, a couple more things. Nefertary uses. This is exactly what it sounds like. This is toilet paper. Um, so this is Aether pennsylvanicum. Um, striped maple, snake bark maple, moose wood, also sometimes called toilet paper tree. Um, it's that bigger leaf behind the red maple. They are large leaves. They're tough enough to do the job if you need them to, and they're not poisonous. Um, pretty much everything you might be looking for if you're out in the woods and you really need some toilet paper. Eurybium macrophylla, called lumberjack's toilet paper. Um, I'm not sure if it's called lumberjack's toilet paper because lumberjacks used it, or if it's called lumberjack's toilet paper because you got to be as tough as a lumberjack to use this as toilet paper. Because frankly, the texture of these leaves is a little bit like sandpaper, and I can't imagine that this would be a very comfortable toilet paper. Um, that being said, it's at least not poisonous. So it might scratch you up, but it's not going to give you any sort of rash. Um, that being said, it produces a big, broad leaf. This is a really cool aster species that, that grows well in shady conditions. Um, I'd say probably the majority of our asters are sun lovers, but we have a pretty good selection of shade-loving asters as well. Um, this is one of them. Odd names. Anyone in this audience who is a fan of herbal medicine probably knows quite a few odd names. Um, pleurisy root. Um, is Asclepius tuberosa, the one that I more commonly think of as butterfly milkweed. Um, it's a treatment herbally for pleurisy. Um, you'll also find other things like Aurelia rasmosa. This is sometimes called life of man. If anyone, we have a great big audience today, which is wonderful. If anyone knows why it's called life of man, please, please reach out to me. I have been looking for years to figure out where that name came from. I can't find it. Um, I just think it's a, a epic sounding common name. I like to share it. It's a great name. I just don't know why. There's got to be a story behind it. Um, usually called spikenard, um, but also life of man. 
Um, oh, I forgot to mention, we are getting towards the end of our lecture here. In fact, we're getting right towards the end of our lecture here. So if you have any questions, please do type them out now. Send them towards Penny so we can go through them and, and go through a bit of a, a question and answer session at the end. Um, on, all right, so before we get into the end, though, strange choices. This is what I'm going to call another strange choices, fall cleanup. Um, for many, many years, I worked, as I said, in kind of traditional horticulture industry. I didn't have much of a head for ecology or sustainability. I didn't know any better then. I learned a lot of lessons by doing things wrong at first and then learning from them. Um, and one of the major ways that me and my crew made money was doing fall cleanup. Um, we did a whole lot of unnecessary stuff that we convinced people they needed to do, and it kept us paid. Um, frankly, fall cleanup is really overrated. So on a spectrum of clean up absolutely everything in fall to do absolutely nothing in fall, it becomes a personal choice. Um, you know, what do you want your space to look like? How much mess are you willing to put up with? How much ecology do you want to put forward? Um, how lazy do you want to be? And how much do you want a good reason to be lazy? Um, I'm going to push you more onto the don't do it side of things, and I'm going to let you decide exactly where on that spectrum you want to fall. But here's why you might think to not do so much cleanup in fall. First off, it's better for the plants themselves. Um, this, in most winters, doesn't actually make much of a difference. But there are certain winters where it makes a big difference. And what I mean by that is pretty much those cold, dry winters. Um, the winter where it gets particularly cold, but we don't get a lot of snowfall. Um, snow is a very good insulator. It's good at insulating the crowns of plants that are in many cases right underneath the soil level and stopping them from getting as cold as the ambient air temperatures. So when we get a dry winter and you don't get a lot of snow, you want as much snow as possible reaching that crown as, as, as could ever be possible. And what leaving plants standing does is collect snow on those stems. Look at the Samsonia here. Got all the snow collecting on the stems, and imagine that the day then starts to get a little warm and the snow starts to melt a little bit, and it starts to slide down those stems right onto the crown of the plant. Um, leaving the plant standing is actually quite a good way of directing what little snow you might get in a dry winter exactly where you want it to be. And if you've got a plant you just planted in fall, or if you're planting non-native plants that maybe aren't exactly hardy, um, this can mean the difference between surviving and not. It's better for birds. I'll never understand why we go through our gardens in fall and cut back all of the plants that are absolutely chock full of bird seed, and then we go to the store and buy bird seed. Um, this is uh, Monarda fistulosa there. It's wild bergamot, and what you're looking at is bird seed. Um, this is native bird seed. If it makes its way through the bird, it's free plants. Um, assuming you're treating your plants in an organic manner, this is organic bird seed. You know, the more expensive stuff if you go to the store. Um, this is great stuff. The birds want this seed. It's also good habitat for birds. You know, they, if having standing stems means they've got protection from predators. So if you're a fan of birds, you will see a whole lot more birds in your garden if you leave your plants standing for the wintertime. Next, it's better for the bees. Um, the majority of our bees, about 67% of them, will nest in the ground over the winter. But the rest of them nest in standing, dried, mostly herbaceous stems. Um, they will burrow into there, and they'll spend the winter in there, often laying eggs, um, sometimes not, depending on the species. And if we go and cut back all of these stems in the fall, we've removed that habitat from the landscape. Leaving it up till the spring means that we've got habitat in place for those um, bees to nest in. Fair for the butterflies. Um, and what I mean by this is not the standing stems, but the down leaves. Um, we have a variety of butterflies that will overwinter either in a, in a chrysalis stage or in some cases as eggs or in the case of the woolly bear here as an actual caterpillar. And they will often nest in the leaf litter. Um, so if we're raking up all those leaves and taking them and leaving them on the, you know, kind of curbside for the garbage man to pick up, we're removing that habitat from the landscape. And finally, it's better for seedlings. Um, as I said, leaving stems standing up means leaving seed in place. There's a lot of plants that have developed the, the strategy where they will distribute a lot of their seed before the snow is hit, but will also, you know, there will still be some seed distributing after snow is hit. Imagine seed hitting the top of snow, especially if we get that kind of icy sheet on top. A little light wind can blow seed long distances. It's a great strategy for dispersing seed, you know, insurance policy, multiple methods of dispersal. Um, and so if we're cutting back our plants in fall, we're removing that seed bank. Um, I like having a seed bank in place. It means that the weeds in my garden are things like Rebecca herda and Monarda punctata and lobelias and the sort of plants that I love having as weeds. 
Um, you know, they're not even weeds at that point, although maybe you can argue they are, depending on where they're growing. Last reason is it's better for us. This is a selfish one, but it's really not all that selfish. It looks cool. Um, this is something we can see all winter long. You know, this is this is anemone virginiana. This is thimbleweed. Um, this is a cool texture in the winter time. Think about the the metusia that I was mentioning, the fiddlehead fern. Um, I like seeing these textures in the winter time. They make for interest on the landscape. Um, you know, the, the beauty of snow doesn't get diminished at all by having some cool textures added to it. Um, and it's something that I will enjoy each time I see it. With that in mind. Um, I am a bit over on my time. It's 1.20. I'm surprised. I usually go really fast with these uh, webinars. Um, I am open for questions now. Please send them along in the questions function, and Penny is likely looking through them now, and we'll pass them along to me, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you all for paying attention to me. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, stick around if you want to hear some questions answered. Penny, you there? Thanks, Dan. This is, this is great. We have several questions. Would you recommend a book or two for a source of native edibles and or foraging? Um, yes, although instead of recommending books, let me give you authors. Um, Samuel Thayer, um, he wrote a couple different books. Um, I think, let's see, yo, Nate, you know, I'm blanking on the names of his books. He's got three books out there. I think it's Nature's Harvest and maybe a Gardener's Bounty, something like that. But the name is Samuel Thayer. Um, he was a food scientist turned forager, so what's kind of nice about his books is he goes through specifics on nutrition and things like, uh, you know, there's a, a, a myth out there, it's false, that milkweed is poisonous. It's not, it's wonderfully edible, um, and he talks about how he tested it and what he did to confirm that. Um, a really good local author, Russ Cohen, he wrote the book uh, Wild Plants I've Known in Eden. Um, what he does that Samuel Thayer does not is he introduces some really wonderful recipes in amongst his books. Um, he will talk about how to make, say, a, uh, a Japanese um, knotweed fritter um, or, or Jerusalem artichoke pie, or he's got some fantastic um, edible kind of things in there, not only on natives but also on invasives. Um, he likes to recommend the idea of removing invasives by eating the things and, and kind of getting rid of them in addition to you know, yank them out and then eat them, not not plant them because they're tasty. He's, he's quite clear about that, and read the introduction to his book. Um, let's see if there's any others that jump out at me. Those are the two that I go to first, Samuel Thayer and Russ Cohen. Um, there's some other books out there. There was a book just released recently um, on native plant agriculture. Um, I just picked it up the other day. I haven't had a chance to read through it yet. I've heard good things about it, um, but I can't speak through experience just yet. I'm hoping in the future I will be able to add my name to the list of, of native plant edible books out there. I'm, I'm hoping to produce one, but I don't have anything just yet. Great. Thanks, Dan. Will Pennsylvania sedge and wild strawberry grow well in the mid-Maryland area through their heat and humidity? So um, I would recommend reaching out to... Um, so the simple answer is yes. Um, for here, Virginiana will grow absolutely anywhere. That thing grows from Maine down through Florida and is quite happy absolutely anywhere. Um, Pennsylvania sedge, um, Mount Cuba did a number of trials a couple of years ago on sedges. One of the ones they tested was Pennsylvania sedge, and I would recommend reaching out to them for d distinct details as to exactly where it does well and where it does not. Um, in New England, I could say Pennsylvania sedge will do well anywhere from sun to shade and everywhere in between. Um, in the Maryland area, I know it will do perfectly fine in shady conditions. I expect it would do well in the sun as well, but you can get a better local source of information um, by reaching out to Mount Cuba. I think you could probably just find the information right on their website. Um, but George Coombs, who's now their director of horticulture, he used to run their trial program. Um, and he knows everything about growing sedges in exactly your neck of the woods. Very good. Which herbaceous plants are good for bee nesting? For bee nesting. Um, so herbaceous plants. Um, let, me, let me flip it around real quickly and give you the two woody species I know that are good because it's mostly herbaceous plants. So if you're doing woodies, we're talking about rubus and sambucus. So those are our raspberries, blackberries, those sort of things, and elderberry, um, both of which are good for bee nesting. Um, on the herbaceous spectrum, the ones that I know are considered kind of top of the list are the Joe pieweeds. Um, those are often loved by, by our native bees. 
Um, I have heard reports that you can find uh, native bees in a variety of the mint species, so that includes the bee bombs, the scutellaria, agastache. You can find them in golden rods quite readily. And asters seem to be hit or miss. Um, from what I understand, you will often find them in the sun-loving asters, but not the shade-loving asters. Um, to throw out another name of someone who could probably answer that question even more effectively than I could, check out Heather Holm. Um, she's written a number of books on bees, and every time I've had a bee question and I've sent it her way, she's given me a full answer in its entirety. Um, uh, everything I told you I can guarantee is true, but if you want even more, I would highly recommend reaching out to Heather or checking out her books and you can probably find a lot more than just a few I mentioned. Keep in mind, folks, I'm a plant guy who's getting to know my insects reasonably well, but, but Heather is an insect woman who knows her plants very well. <laughs> very good. Uh, the next question, Dan, is where was this lovely photo taken on your last slide? Oh, I'm cheating. This is in New England. Um, this is the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is actually the, the side of Mount Rainier. It's from a trip I took, uh, I guess that was two years ago. Um, what you're looking at there are a variety of different heath species. Um, the, on the, the, the West Coast, you have uh, more huckleberries than blueberries um, as compared to if you saw this picture in New England, I'd say it's mostly low bush blueberry species and some huckleberries. Um, but out, it's, it's a, kind of a heath area. Um, this, I can't remember what the elevation was, but quite high. Um, I think that the low elevation of, of Mount Rainier is about as high as the highest elevation in New England. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful place. I highly recommend it for a visit. It's kind of ironic. I went there in fall, and the Pacific Northwest has a lot going for it. Um, but fall foliage compared to New England is nothing. You know, we, we've got the fall foliage in New England that blows everyone else out of the water. And I was scoffing at how, you know, the Pacific Northwest couldn't compare to New England in fall foliage um, until I went to Mount Rainier and realized that though they may not have as widespread of a fall foliage display as we have in New England, there are certain places like Rainier here that are absolutely phenomenal in fall. Um, down in low elevation, you get the big leaf asters, sorry, um, big leaf maples, which fall wise, color wise, are nothing all this spectacular. They have some amazing other aspects to them that make them a really, really cool maple species. Um, but compare them to, say, a red maple, uh, at least on that count, you know, New England's got the West Coast beat, but Mount Rainier in fall is incredible. That's a stunning photo. Next question, when is it safe to clean up in the spring without hurting the wildlife species? So um, Xerxes Society has been really good about giving me some detailed information on this. And when I last reached out to them, they told me, look for, so that what I used to say was look for things flying around. You know, if you see bees buzzing around, you're good to go. Um, they made it a little more specific. And what they recommended to me is look for three consecutive days that are reaching 50 degrees. Once you've got three days in the 50s, you're good to go. And things have started waking up and moving around, and you can then go ahead and make your cutbacks. Um, if you're unsure or if you find you need to cut back sooner, um, a, a quick and easy strategy, what you can do is cut back your herbaceous stuff, um, bundle it up into kind of standing bundles, trying to keep them all in the upright position, and then just lean them up against a fence or up against a tree. Um, and by doing that, instead of throwing them in the compost pile, that gives any bees that might still be inside, you know, the time they need to emerge and, you know, kind of fly off. And then once, you know, things are up and growing and things are flying around, you can just collect those bundles and throw them in the compost pile. Okay, great. What sources do you recommend for information and plant material for the Cape Cod area? Um, okay, so... Information, um, there is a, if you hop onto my website or if you go onto the Native Plant Trust website, you'll find a link to a database that I started building while I was there. Um, Melanie Kenny has been working on it since then, so it's been updated uh, recently. Um, it's called the Plant Finder website. Um, and what's great about it is it allows you to punch in things like growing conditions, ecological value, you know, colors of flowers or fruit or edibility, and it'll give you lists of plants that'll fit whatever characteristics you've kind of put in there. Um, you'll find similar sort of databases through Mount Cuba, um, through North Creek Nurseries, through um, um, the, uh, oh, I'm blanking on it, um, West Coast, Texas, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. They have also a great website. Um, I recommend all of them for great sources of information. Um, there's some fantastic books out there. 
Um, you know, Doug Talame is a name I think people should get to know well. Um, William Kalina, who wrote some fantastic books on growing and propagating native species. Um, Rick Dark, another really good, you know, kind of this, this endless supply of good names out there. Um, as far as sources of plants, um, I don't know the coastal region as well as, as I think I should to answer this question well. Um, I can tell you that Grow Native Massachusetts does an annual plant sale, um, and they, they produce a, an immense amount of plants. I believe they are centered in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is at least more coastal than I am in Phillipson, Mass. Um, and they would be a good source of not only plant material, but could probably give you some recommendations for nurseries in the area. Um, I would also check the ELA website. Um, we have some information on there about finding EcoPros, and we'll give you some kind of good connections to finding growers in your region. And I believe you can search that by location. The next question is, what plant was this with small yellow flowers in front of the Asclepius tuberosa? Let's see, in front of us. Oh, I'm, let's see. Um, assuming we're talking about this picture here, um, that's Baptisia tinctoria. It's our native yellow wild indigo. Um, so most people know Baptisia australis as the more common Baptisia in the area. It's, it's actually not one that grows naturally in New England. It grows a little south and west of us. Um, it's still a fantastic plant for gardens. Um, but our, our, the one that you would find naturally occurring in New England is this one here. It's Baptisia tinctoria, yellow wild indigo. I expect that's probably the plant they were talking about. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. We had several comments about sunchokes and the gaseous nature. Uh, this one person left a comment saying, leave them in the winter, leave them in the ground over winter and harvest in the spring. And that uh, cuts down on that problem. So thank you for that. We have- Yes, I'm also- Go ahead. I've, I've heard a couple strategies for reducing the, the gaseous erupt eruptations. Um, one of them is freezing it, and so it, exactly what was just said makes perfect sense. The, the version of it I've heard in the past is to prep your, you know, your kind of, your, your tubers. Um, some people like to shred them and then stick them in the freezer for a little bit before cooking them, and that helps. Um, one thing I've found that helps is I will often skin them, um, and then when possible, cook them on the low and slow side of things instead of the hot and fast. You know, a, a long, slow bake in the oven seems to really help with reducing the, you know, the kind of the gas effects. Um, the one thing I will mention is that the, the, the advantages that inulin provides from a diabetics point of view um, are also reduced whenever you're doing, you know, what you're doing is you're reducing the inulin content. And that's exactly what you want if you're talking from a diabetics point of view. Um, so if, if you're just, if you're not thinking diabetics at all and you really just don't want to fart as much, freeze them or skin them in a long, slow cook. If you're thinking about eating them for a dietary kind of health point of view, and you're thinking about this from a diabetic point of view, to some extent you can say the more you fart, the better you are. <laughs> Very good. Um, the next is, do you have any other suggestions for ideal companions the way you suggested sun choke and ground nuts? Um, so the... Well, um, yes, but too many to mention here. So one of the things that I'll often do is I, I look towards shady environments, assuming they're asking about edible species. Um, I look towards growing food in the shade where companion planting works quite readily. Um, I have, you know, my raised beds where I grow a lot of my annual kind of vegetable crops in the sun. And then in the shade, I've got a combination of Bruce, sorry, not Bruce Mark Choke, um, Solomon Seals, um, fiddlehead ferns, ramps, may apples. Um, these are all species that work well, kind of interplanted together. The may apples can be somewhat thuggish. So what I do is I put those in the deep shade, which slows them down quite a bit. And I move things like the, um, the ramps, which are, are more slower growing into the kind of partial shade where they get a little more sun. Um, I found that that works quite effectively. Um, one of the other things that I'll say is just from a kind of conceptual point of view, Think of ground covers as a companion planting kind of, you know, silver bullet. Um, if you have standing plants, 
Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, a, a, any sort of standing plant, whether it be a bee bomb or a little blue stem or an agastache or whatever, um, think about surrounding them with ground covers and companion planting in that way. Start looking at all the mulch in your garden as a spot where you could be filling it up with lots more ground covers. And those ground covers become pretty much your living mulch and everything becomes a companion planting as these ground covers companion with all your standing perennials. Very good. In your research, what sun choke would re you recommend that's the least invasive? Or is there such a So there's... Yes and no. Um, first off, I'll say that invasive as a term is something that I specifically hold towards true invasive species. And what I mean by that is non-native species that cause environmental and ecological harm. Um, as a native species, I could easily call this one a thug, but I wouldn't call it invasive. Um, the great difference between this is when the sun show comes in and takes over a whole area, it still provides great wildlife habitat, where you will not find the same thing in, a, in say, you know, purple loosestrife. Um, in terms of better behaved, so this is the first year where I'm going to be testing out a variety of different, um, you know, cultivars and varieties, and there's a number that have been grown specifically to be better behaved. Um, I haven't yet worked with any of them, so all I can say is I'm going to be testing it this year. What I've been working with in the past are seed-grown, you know, forms, individuals that I've grown, and they've all been quite vigorous. Um, I would recommend looking at, oh, I can't remember if it was... I think it was Oikos, if I remember correctly, was the company I purchased mine from, um, who I don't know if someone there is really into them or if they just happen to acquire a, a bunch of different varieties, but they had something like 30 different cultivated forms that all have good descriptions talking about differences in flavor, differences in growth, differences in harvest and cleaning. Um, I would check out their website and see what they've got to offer um, or ask me the same question in one year's time when I've had a year to test them and I should be able to answer you a little more effectively. Okay, very good. We had several questions about the spring ephemeral stand. Would it be possible to get a list so that when I send out the link to the recording that I could attach the list of spring ephemerals? Yes, I've got a, um, a, a handout that is associated with this lecture. Um, I will make sure to get it to you, Penny, so you can send it out with everything else. Great, excellent. And the next question is about using Fragaria for lawn areas. How do you keep it out of the surrounding planting beds? Oh, that's a damn good question. Um, so the, the answer is that you don't. Um, and what I mean by that is you need to decide where that plant makes sense. It is a vigorous spreader. Um, that spread makes it quite effective for a lawn that can handle abuse, but the downside to that is it wants to move in on you. So if it's next to a garden bed full of, say, standing, you know, tall herbaceous perennials like meadow-style plants, or if it's next to a landscape dominated by woody species, you can just think of it as a very vigorous ground cover. But if it's next to your delicate, you know, kind of English cottage-style garden or next to some hellebores or some, you know, sanguinaria or something on the more delicate side of things, you probably don't want to be putting strawberries there because it will move in on you and it will outcompete pretty much everything else unless you're in there weeding it. Um, the advantage to that means, you know, it, it pretty much, it, it weeds itself out. Like, as in, you don't have to deal with weeds growing in amongst it because it's so darn vigorous. Great for a lawn. Um, but that vigor has got a dark side as well as a bright side. So, really, it's, it's about placing it in the right spot. Um, if you want something that you could plant next to garden beds, the Carex is quite effective for that. Um, the vigor on Carex is, is not nearly the same as it is on the wild strawberry. And so, you can effectively grow it as pretty much a companion plant. I'm starting to work with another species, um, Prunella vulgaris subspecies lanceolata, which is the, uh, our native self heel um, or heel all, depending on whose name you want to go with. Um, I expect that one might work well for a middle ground, you know, not as vigorous as Fragaria, but more vigorous than Carex pennsylvanica. Um, but I'm still in the early stages of testing, so I can't make any guarantees just yet. Okay, and the next question is, how thoroughly do you have to do site prep in order to get it established? Um, so what I recommend is if you're if you're trying to do it over a, an existing lawn, it's it's quite an easy process. I don't bother with digging anymore. It's more trouble than it's worth, and I don't like removing the organic matter. Um, what I recommend is pretty much a smothering operation. 
Go to your local hardware store and pick up a product called Ramboard um, or something similar to it. I'm sure there's other companies that make it. Ramboard's just the one I know. What it is is it's a product that painters use to protect floors from drips, um, and it's nothing more than a roll of cardboard. And I will roll out my cardboard on top of the lawn. I will pin it down either with some bricks or rocks or some garden staples, um, and I will then top it with whatever I've got on hand. Often, if I've got it on hand, I'll do a, a mix of compost and well-aged wood chips. And from there, you can just wait till that lawn is smothered and then plant directly on top of it. You never remove the cardboard. Um, there's no need to dig out your, your kind of, you know, your lawn underneath, and it just decomposes, and the cardboard decomposes and just takes space for you. If you want to plant immediately into it, I'd recommend a top dressing of, of topsoil on top, so you can put your strawberries, say, right into that topsoil. And by the time their roots have colonized the topsoil, your cardboard and everything else is starting to decompose, and they'll just root down underneath it. It's a whole lot easier than trying to dig everything out. That sounds, sounds great. We have so many more questions, and we normally cut these off uh, long before this, but these are unusual times. So if you're willing, Dan, I'll continue on with these last questions. Yeah, keep them coming. Okay, very good. Uh, you mentioned three consecutive days of 50 degrees. This is asking for a clarification. Is that daytime temperature? Um, so, yes, that's daytime temperature. And what I would recommend is, is checking out the Xerxes Society. Um, as I kind of joked before, I'm a plant guy learning my insects. Xerxes Society are, are insect folks, and they are darn good. Um, they really know their stuff, and they have a lot of very good kind of best use practices and practical kind of application practices. Um, I would pose the question to them. They may even have additionally updated information, um, and they could probably give you very specific details on exactly when you can start cutting things back. Um, they're also just a fantastic organization that I'd recommend you all get to know. Very good. Back to the wild strawberries. Will they crowd out Bishop's Weed? So it's a yes and no sort of answer, which I hate, but let me let me quantify. Um, if you simply plant them next to Bishop's Weed, then you're going to see a battle that will probably outlive all of us, and I expect both plants will be there in, you know, 200 years. Um, what I have effectively done with wild strawberries and specifically with Bishop's Weed at home, where I, in, I inherited a nice pile of Bishop's Weed when we moved into our house, is if you simply yank out Bishop's Weed, um, those of you who have done it before know that unless you get every little bit of root, it regrows and it regrows and it regrows and it regrows. Um, so what I recommend doing is yanking it out while simultaneously planting your wild strawberries. Um, and so as it starts to regrow and your wild strawberries start to kind of fill in, you then go weed out the bishop's weed again. And you do this instead of till the end of time, you do it, you know, five, six, eight times, however many times you're needed. And every time you do it, the bishop's weed is getting set back again and again and your strawberries are starting to grow more and more vigorously. You'll get to a point where the strawberry is nice and vigorous and is mature, and the bishop's weed is just barely trying to grow, and at that point, the strawberries will hold their own and will take over the space and will stop the bishop's weed from coming back. Um, but it's not simply plant the strawberries and your job is done. It's plant the strawberries and help them to get up to the competitive level, and then they will hold the spot for you in place of the bishop's weed in the long term. Okay. Do you have suggestions for other native lawn alternatives that can handle significant foot traffic? Uh, this references thousands of people in a weekend, so this must be a public green space. So the simple answer to that is no, I don't. Um, it's something I'm testing now, but as far as real heavy-duty foot traffic, um, we're looking for the sort of vigor that you don't tend to want in a plant because it's overly vigorous. Um, and that's where the strawberries are really the, my kind of best option, is that they've got the, the amount of vigor that we need. Um, most of our other native plants that have that level of vigor are things that would not work well as a lawn. I mean, imagine trying to make a lawn out of staghorn sumac. It just doesn't work. Um, this is where I will say kill your lawns. They're terrible things. They're awful in the environment. But I'm not going to say that every single lawn needs to go because there's still a value in turf grass for exactly those sort of uses. Um, you know, for example, here at Norcross, we don't do a lot of lawns other than as turf trails. Um, our, our trails through the gardens are often a, a European turf grass. We try and treat it well. Um, but that is something that um, we're actually starting to work with more strawberries taking their place. 
but every test I've done with other native alternatives that can grow well as a lawn have not been able to handle that level of foot traffic. When you start getting to those higher levels, um, that's where we still need more testing. I'm not going to say there aren't good options out there. I'm just going to say I don't know them yet. Um, we are working on it. I'm hoping to see something in the future. There's um, there's Prunella vulgaris that I mentioned. I think that, that one I know can handle foot traffic. How much foot traffic I, it can handle is still to be considered. Um, the other one that is in the spectrum that I, I've really not yet tested much yet is Festuca rubra variety rubra, which is our native red fescue. Um, you'll find a lot of red fescue in, in lawn mixes. It's the European red fescue. We have a native one. Telling the two apart is very challenging. Um, and so being able to get your hands on the right one and then testing it has been a bit of a bottleneck for me. Um, that being said, it's one that I hope to test in the future. But unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for this question. Not yet, at least. Okay. Uh, this is a comment that yarrow is another great hardy lawn alternative that can be mowed. Have you had experience with that? Um, I've had it in meadows um, where it's grown and it's handled, you know, a, a meadow style mowing as in like every one to three to five years, but I've never used it in a lawn sort of application. Um, I'd be curious to give that a try. I've, I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a comment. I was curious if cottonwood fluff can be used as kapok or milkweed. I would expect that it likely could be, although not speaking from experience and having tried here, I think the limiting factor with that one would be um, availability of the material in large amounts. Um, think about how much fluff you can get out of a field of milkweed. Um, you know, it can it could really be an immense amount. Um, whereas cottonwoods, you know, though you can grow quite a few of them, collecting the fluff and getting the mass of it would probably be your limiting factor. Um, the kapok trees were grown in plantations. They were managed specifically for that purpose. Um, I would expect it would probably work just fine, although these days everything is pretty much filled with synthetic material and there's not a lot of use of the natural materials anymore. Um, that being said, I've, I've heard of a couple companies that are stuffing pillows with milkweed fluff, and um, I'd like to think that there's going to be a bit more of it in the future. Very good. We've had a few questions about the poisonous nature of certain plants, taxes, sassafras, and others. Is there a resource that you could recommend for toxicity? You know, I have looked for years for a good resource on toxicity, and I haven't found one. Um, I, could, I could give you the name Samuel Thayer that I mentioned for edible stuff. He talks a lot about you know, the, the medicinal, poisonous, edible value on the plants that he does talk about, um, but he doesn't talk about toxicity across the board by any means. Um, there's a website that I like to check somewhat regularly called Plants for a Future, um, which has a lot of information in terms of edibility and medicinal and poison, um, but the, the information is mixed. There's some really good information on there. There's some information on there where what, what they're good at doing is saying when they can't confirm the information they have. So, for example, they will say, you know, we found reports this is poisonous. We cannot confirm. We don't know the source, that sort of thing. They're honest about whether, you know, how good their information is. Um, so they're probably a good starting source. And, and one of the things I really like about them is uh, you, you can, whenever they have a recommendation, they'll have a little, you know, kind of note next to it that will lead you towards their source page. And then you can go through their sources and get additional information. Um, I don't have a great source, though, on, on toxicity specifically. And if anyone else does, I would love to hear about it. Okay. We have a couple of things more on edibles. One is to remind us all about stocking the wild asparagus by Yul Gibbons. Thank you. That's a that. fantastic book. Yes, great suggestion. Uh, the next is on... Cinnamon fern heads, are they edible? They are not. Um, the only fern that you should be eating is the one that we call the fiddlehead fern or ostrich fern, Metusia struthiopteris. Um, there's some historical um, edibility within some of the, the, the Native American tribes of lady fern and bracken fern, but neither one has been studied um, to the extent that fiddlehead fern has. We know exactly what you can and can't eat with fiddlehead fern. 
Um, and the basic rundown on it is that it's edible when prepared correctly. It's not hard to prepare correctly, but you do need to know what you're doing. Um, you want to start by cooking it in a large batch of boiling water. And what that's going to do is to leach the tannins out of the fronds. Um, and if you've got enough tannins, and we're talking really, really high amounts, much more than you'd ever eat in a, a setting of fiddle -head fern, but if you were to consume enough tannins, they could actually disrupt your body's ability to absorb um, proteins. Um, so the, the first stage of cooking is boiling water, which leaches out tannins. Um, after that, though, it goes into a pan on high heat. And the reason for that is there's an enzyme in there called thiaminase. And thiaminase has the ability to, um, to disrupt our body's ability to absorb vitamin B. Um, it breaks down upon high heat, though. So, you know, the boiling water is not high enough, but pan um, heat is. So first into boiling water, then into the pan, and you've got a fiddlehead, which tastes absolutely fantastic, is chock full of iron and vitamin A, um, and whose tannins have been leached out and whose thiaminase has been broken down and is perfectly safe to eat. Okay, very good. Uh, do birds like baneberry, and can they eat the berries? Birds do eat baneberry. Um, they don't flock towards it. Um, it's not something that you tend to see them eat immediately, which has got the advantage of us actually getting to see the berries for quite a while before they get to it. Um, I've, I've seen for years I've been watching the baneberries fruit and then the berries disappear, so I know someone's eating it. The only bird I've actually ever caught in the act of eating it is catbirds. Um, that being said, I'd be surprised if there aren't other ones eating it. Someone's eating it because it definitely disappears. Um, that being said, it's it's visible for quite a while, and you get to really enjoy the show before it finally does get eaten up. Okay. Back to the tea. Can Pinus rigida needles be used for tea? Uh, they can. Um, as far as I know, and I would double-check this before quoting me on it, but I do believe that all of our native pines are edible in the tea form. Um, some of them are considered tastier than others. Um, white pine is the one I've always used because it's considered very tasty and it's readily available. Um, but as far as I know, um, pitch pine is perfectly edible. This is something that, again, I would, I'd like to confirm before I, I say, you know, I can confirm this right now. Let's check. Um, I'm going to hop onto that website, Plants for Future, and see what they say about it. Um, and in fact, let me share my screen and you can see where I'm going. Okay. So this is Plants for a Future. And let's see what they say. So we've got an edibility rating of one out of five, pretty poor. There's a known hazard here. The wood, sawdust, and resins from various species of pine can cause dermatitis in sensitive people. So don't take a dust bath in pine. Scrolling down to edibility. The vanilla flavoring is obtained as a byproduct of other resins that are released from the pulpwood. They don't mention making tea out of the needles here at all, um, okay. which either means they don't have the information or it's simply not edible. Um, so I don't recommend making tea from this plant unless someone has another resource that says that it's fine to go with. Um, white pine, on the other end, Pinus uh, strobus, is perfectly edible. Great. Could <laughs> the last few are sort of jumping all over the place. Do you have a source for purple milkweed? Um, I grow it here in the garden, and I know that I used to grow it when I was at Garden in the Woods. Um, but being a rare species in New England, it's it's a bit of a challenge and kind of an ethical question as to, you know, how, you know, everyone should be growing it. I want to say it's available through Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, I, I feel like I've seen it on their kind of source list before. I would check, um, I think Ernst Seeds has often carried it in the past. Um, but it's not one that I've seen available as a mature plant, you know, kind of sitting in a nursery or anywhere. Um, we did sell it at one point at Garden in the Woods, and then we stopped selling it, and I can't remember all the decisions that went into that. Um, these days, if you want to see it, come to Norcross, and I will happily show it off to you, but we're not selling plants here. Okay, very good. This is a comment the Caterpillar Lab in New Hampshire raises the hickory horn devils for anyone who's interested. Yeah, that's uh, Sam Jaffe. Um, not related to me at all, but we were sometimes confused with each other. He does amazing stuff. His workshops are awesome. Um, and if anyone has any caterpillar questions, there's no one better you could ask. Excellent. 
do you know of anyone doing research on Ilex verticillata cultivars for berry value? Um, there's been some new information lately on kind of testing cultivars and their ecological value. I know Doug Talame and some of his grad students have been doing it. Um, Annie White, who was, I think, out of UVM when I um, read, you know, she did some aster information or testing. It's something that I know has now started making the, the rounds on, um, in Mount Cuba's, um, uh, they do cultivar trials and they have started adding ecological value to their cultivar trials. So they would definitely be worth checking in on. I wouldn't be too surprised if they were doing um, winterberry. One thing I'll say is that there are some, there are quite a few cultivars out there that make the claim that the berries will last all winter long. Um, when you hear that claim, the, you know, the other way of saying that is that nobody is interested in eating the berries. There's something that the wildlife is, is getting turned off by in the terms of those berries. Um, so the fact that they last all winter long is nice from aesthetics point of view, but is likely a kind of a, a sign that ecologically they're greatly reduced. Um, the better question that needs the testing is, is there a reduction in the nutritional value of the berries that are still getting eaten? Um, and to that, I don't have a good answer. Um, now Cuba and Annie White are the two people I would check in on, but I don't know if they've been doing that research specifically on Ilex. Okay. Could you tell us if aronia is susceptible to phytoptera and rust? I have not seen any of the root rots or foliar diseases affecting the, the choke berries. They have been pretty much bomb-proof plants in terms of, you know, the needs of a gardener. Um, they're, they're quite easy to work with. Um, I've, I've had issues with Phytophthora on a variety of different species, including, you know, rose family species, but chokeberry has never been a problem. Um, they'll grow in literally standing wet, stagnant conditions, which is where Phytophthora tends to be a real big issue, and they've never had any issues. Um, I've also never seen any rust on it. They are not a host, a secondary host for any of the apple rusts, you know, cedar apple rust or, or cedar hawthorn rust or any of those. Um, there's no cedar chokeberry rust. Um, frankly, there, I've not had any issues, whether it becomes insect, disease, pest, or really anything with chokeberry. They're a very, very resilient and wonderful plant. I, it's part of the reason why I think everyone should be growing them. Very good. Do you have opinions on large generalist insect predators in the garden, such as non-native non praying mantis? I'm not a huge fan of praying mantis, um, not because they're large, but specifically because they're generalists. Um, if I'm talking about introducing a non-native you know, animal as a biocontrol, I want to be sure that it's a specialist, something that will focus specifically on the pests that I wanted to go after and not jump towards other species. Um, you know, we've, we've had some kind of, you know, glaring mistakes doing that. Think about like cane toads in Australia um, or the feral hogs in, in Hawaii. Um, these are, are generalist species that have since run amok. Whereas if you look at something like the Gallaricella beetle, which has been released to, um, to take care of purple loose strife or the tachinid fly, which has been released for the, is that woolly adelgid? No, that was winter moth. Um, but the, the great thing about those is that they are specific. They're specialists. Um, they go after that single pest, um, and they remove that pest, and they're good at it. Um, you, you know, you might have an outbreak of, you know, you name the Japanese beetles in your garden. You release praying mantis. There's nothing saying the praying mantis is going to eat the Japanese beetle. They could just as easily go out and start eating your bumblebees. Um, so what I'm looking for is specificity in any releases that I'm thinking about making, and I think that's really an important piece to, uh, to bring into it. Um, praying mantis aren't very good at that, um, but there are other ones that are. Um, you know, look towards things like lace wings or gallaricella beetles, to kinid flies. Um, I feel like I'm throwing a lot of names at people today, but um, um, Joe Elkington, um, I think he's out of URI, or maybe Worcester Polytechnic. I'm not sure. Joe Elkington's definitely the right name. Um, he's done quite a bit of research on insect biocontrols. Um, he has managed. Um, the winter moth control in Massachusetts for a number of years now, um, definitely a good source of information on, on biocontrols in, in our native flora. All right. Can you recommend a resource for learning wildlife and funnel associations? There's Maybe they mean floral. 
Yeah, there's there's not been a, a lot recently or, or even in the past on connecting the two. Often the, the resources are here's a good resource for learning your plants, here's a good resource for learning your insects, and finding the connection between the two has been the challenge that, that I've been trying to kind of find a middle ground for. Um, Heather Holm, who I mentioned earlier, is great for, um, you know, specifically bees and their interactions with native plants. Um, Doug Talame has been great for uh, connection between, um, you know, kind of uh, mostly the, the Lepidoptera and our native plants. Um, he connected with the uh, National Wildlife Federation, and they made a plant finder database that is specific towards um, floral and faunal connections where, you know, you punch in a plant and it'll tell you the various different insects that'll host on it or vice versa. Um, so I would, I'd recommend checking out the, the National Wildlife Federation's Plant Finder app or, or Native Plant Finder, something to that extent. You'll find it. Um, but there has not been, it's kind of a, a almost, I won't say it's a new branch of science by any means, but it's, it's a new interest or there's, there's been new um, interest in people researching it. And we're kind of at the early stages. Um, so there's not a ton out there just yet, but there's a lot more coming along as we go. Okay, we're going to wrap it up with one final question because we're coming up on a two-hour mark. Could you recommend <laughs> any good sources for further study on plants that indigenous people used for food and medicine? Um, Arthur Haynes is probably a good resource. Um, he is not indigenous himself, but he's got some very strong connections within the, you know, the, the, the first peoples of the area. I know that he has um, spoken to me in the past about some of the, you know, the information he has connected. Um, he wrote a couple books. Um, uh, what is it called? Ancestral Plants. Is that correct? I might be misquoting him um, on the title name, but Arthur Haynes is the name. He's the same guy that wrote The Floor Nova Angley. Um, but his other kind of hat that he wears, in addition to taxonomy, is, um, you know, ancestral uses of plants, both edible, medicinal, fiber, stuff like that. Um, he himself is a good resource for information. But um, secondly, I think he could probably also direct people towards additional resources for indigenous uses of plants. What I have found in the past has always been, um, you know, very kind of surface level where it says, you know, this tribe used this plant. Um, and sometimes maybe this tribe used this plant for this reason, but it, it really didn't go any further into um, the way it was used or how it was used or what the effects were. It was really just kind of a, a list. Um, and I've had a little bit of trouble finding better information. Go towards Arthur. He's got good stuff. Thank you, Dan, for sharing all of these great plant oddities. What a, what a fun way to learn about the backstory of some of these plants that we just had not known about. And thank you all for joining us for a walk in the garden. We encourage you to enjoy the calming power and time in your gardens and green spaces soon. Be safe and well, and visit us for another walk in the garden soon. Yes, thank you all so much for coming and stay healthy.